back. This is Boomer Life on Sea Isle 650. And we're back. This is Boomer Life on CL 650. I'm Joanne Sutton. Joining us in the studio today from Next Gen Hearing is registered audiologist and teaching professional, Dr. Ted Venema. And today we're recalling a very informative and very helpful conversation that we had recently with two amazing surgeons, Dr. Brian Westerberg and Dr. Jane Lee, both otologists based out of St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. And actually, to be more specific, they work at the BC Rotary Hearing and Balance Center at St. Paul's. It's the actual referral center for patients in this province with complex ear and hearing related disorders. So Dr. Ted, can you tell us a little bit about what type of patients would be referred to this clinic at St. Paul's? Well, you get referrals with pathologies of the ear that are usually reported to a general practitioner, a family physician. Somebody's got dizziness, rotary vertigo kind of problems, ringing in the ear, balance difficulties. A person usually goes to his or her family doctor and the family doctor examines whether, whether the, the person needs a referral or not. And that's what usually, that's what the, gate, the gatekeeper is the family physician and referring you to the eye specialist or the ear specialist. And these are two ear, nose and throat specialists, ENTs. Correct. And we're talking about this very special clinic that's been established at St. Paul's Hospital. It's the BC Rotary Hearing and Balance Centre. And Dr. Ted, this centre is something that your next gen founder, Mark Hambly, holds a very, very strong connection with. That's right. Mark Hambly, the CEO of Next Gen, has always valued interaction with physicians and I think he's on the dead ringer right path in that regard having a good connection to physicians because that's a real referral source and next gen is dealing with a medical situation hearing and hearing loss is highly prevalent and highly underrated I think not enough people really look at it because it's an invisible handicap you can't see hearing loss and people believe what they see and so Mark wisely has chosen to partner with physicians in particular and I think that's what makes next gen a rather unique hearing aid um, franchise. Uh, Absolutely. I think it sets them apart from many others. It's a real hands-on. I believe you're right. Okay. So let's pick up our conversation now with Dr. Jane Lee and also Dr. Brian Westerberg. I think this is Brian now who's going to be describing what happens behind the scenes at the St. Paul's Rotary Hearing Clinic. Let's listen in. Uh, So it's the main referral center in British Columbia for patients with complex ear and balance disorders. Uh, The name Rotary is in it because the Vancouver Rotary Club has a hearing foundation that has been in existence for probably at least 30 years, I think, um, and has been a strong contributor to the clinic in terms of the equipment that we need to adequately uh, diagnose hearing uh, problems and also imaging uh, equipment that we're able to show the patients exactly what's happening in their ear rather than just describing it to them. So I'll pose this question for both of our specialists today. Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Brian. What motivated you to go into this field? You know, I'm just trying to picture you at med school and trying to, you know, figure out what kind of a doctor or surgeon you want to be. And and how did you ever get um, geared towards becoming an otologist? A uh, complex question to answer. I started out in general surgery, quickly realized that although the surgery itself was interesting, it was there was a lot of pre-surgery and a lot of post-surgery care that um, takes a long time. And so I, I was looking around for something else, and a, call, a medical student, uh, call a medical school colleague mentioned otolaryngology, so I did a rotation in that and really enjoyed it and applied for and got accepted here at the University of British Columbia. When I came out, I got uh, accepted into a year of research first before doing my residency, and I spent the year of research working with uh, Dietrich Schwartz, who was a basic science research at UBC looking at uh, hearing and balance disorders. And during that year, I did a presentation as part of our grand rounds on uh, the inner ear and how the inner ear works, and I, I just found it mesmerizing. It was just amazing all the delicacy in your ear and how it evolved, how it came to do what it does and what it is able to do and and the physiology behind that and the ways that we could assess it. I just uh, found it fascinating and that's what pulled me into otology. And you've been doing this for how many years now? 
Uh, 21. Mm, wow. And Dr. Jane Lee, I'll, I'll pose the same question to you. Uh, Dr. Lee's been with St. Paul's Hospital for at least four years, right? Um, yeah, I moved out here in 2010 to do uh, subspecialty fellowship training. Okay, so... Um, so uh, it's been since 2010 that I've been here at St. Paul's. And as an otolaryngologist uh, with your specialty in otology and neurootology, uh, tell me why you think you have the best job in the world. Oh, I, I definitely do think I have the best job in the world. Um, I think it's a really privileged place to be, to be able to restore hearing. Hearing is so integral in um, being a human being and being able to communicate, um, not necessarily just hearing, but any communication I think sets us apart from um, other beings, and I think it's essential to our well-being. Um, so for me, I think the groundbreaking moment was seeing a cochlear implant or even just a a minor ear procedure where someone can't hear, you know, as simple as removing wax from someone's ear that can restore hearing, it has a huge impact on someone's quality of life. And that was probably what drove me into wanting to become an otologist. I'm just wondering, is, was there any personal connection? Did you have any anybody in your family that might have had um, a situation with hearing loss? Um, no, actually. Um, we've been pretty fortunate in terms of that. So there wasn't anyone that I was impacted by within my family but i think you know growing up you're you're always around someone that you can relate to that has had hearing hearing loss or see the impact it can have um in terms of uh especially when it's not remedied and how that can create social isolation Uh, so i think um you know we can all see that in some parts of our life growing up so maybe i could get one of you to describe why hearing is is such a, a complex process it's not um as cut and dried as Sight, yeah, right. Uh, I'm happy to jump in there, and Jane can maybe give her insight too. Um, Joanne, do you ever go swimming? All the time. When you put your head underwater and your girlfriends are yelling at you, what do you hear? Uh, muffled noise. Yeah, it's all sort of mumbled. It's all jumbled. And the reason for that is there's an air-water interface. So as they're speaking above the water, the sound energy. Um, of their voices, about 90% of it, 95% of it gets reflected off the air-water interface and only a little bit goes into the water. Within your ear, there is a similar air-water interface. So the eardrum will capture the sound. That sound is then transmitted by three ear bones into the fluid of the inner ear where all the little nerve endings sense that vibration, transmit it to the brain as an electrical signal and your brain interprets that as sound. So there's an air-water interface in your inner ear, and yet the eardrum and the ear bones are so well designed, they capture about 99% of the energy that hits the eardrum and transmits it through to the inner ear. And that's the challenge we have as surgeons to try and figure out a way of recreating what what was designed immaculately at the the outset. Wow, it's almost like reinventing the wheel in, in a way. Like In some respects, it is. You know, we have man-made prostheses, but they're fairly rudimentary compared to the acicular chain, the little ear bones in your inner ear, yep. middle ear. So I'm also guessing that one of the biggest challenges could be in an extremely difficult process of just trying to diagnose what the actual hearing problem is and, and why. Yeah, there's a really long pathway, you know, and it's amazing it happens within milliseconds. So sound comes in through the outer ear canal, it moves the eardrum, that moves those little ear bones. That third ear bone moves like a piston inside a fluid-filled space. That moves fluid in the organ of hearing, which moves hair cells, which, you know, you get neurotransmitters that are transferred, and that activates the nerve. It gets transferred to the brain, and you hear. That all is happening as I'm speaking, and it, it, it happens seamlessly without thinking about it. But along that pathway, you can have a problem in all of those different places. So, you know, that's where an audiologist comes into. Um, play in terms of figuring out where that is. We do have some rudimentary tools for figuring that out at the bedside as well. But a hearing test will at least help us differentiate whether it's in the outer ear, uh, the middle ear, or the inner ear. Um, And that'll really help us try and figure out what we can best do to improve that patient's hearing. So we're speaking with baby boomers on this show and and know that hearing loss can be a a, a regular part of aging, but not always. Um, Can one of you describe to us what's typically happening with gradual hearing loss? 
Um, so within your inner ear, there are hair cells. The hair cells are literally cells with tiny little hair-like projections on them. And it's the movement of those hairs which sense the vibration of sound. And there's two different hair cells we've come to realize. There's inner hair cells, which are the sensory, the main sensory cells. But uh, juxtaposed to them are the outer hair cells, and the outer hair cells are amplifiers, if you will. The sound that comes in is, is amplified. It's uh, frequently localized by those outer hair cells. Unfortunately, with time, those outer hair cells wear out, and that's probably what happens with aging is the, the projections off of those cells uh, disappear, and then you don't get that same fine-tuning of the inner ear that you get when you're younger. So we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the options that are available to individuals that are experiencing hearing loss. And uh, one of them would be your specialty, uh, Dr. Brian, uh, the cochlear implant program. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the first uh, cochlear implant in Canada was inserted here at St. Paul's in 1982. Um, and uh, that came to be partly because of the, the surgeon who was here at the time, Dr. Patrick Doyle, the audiologist at the time, who was Dr. Sipka Pyle, and also because of the uh, Vancouver Rotary Club who helped fund those early patients and the, and the uh, equipment that was necessary for it all to happen. Originally, we were putting in maybe one or two implants per year that gradually increased to 10 per year, then to 25 per year. And then in this past year, we've probably put in over 70 cochlear implants between Dr. Lee and I. Uh, it's an amazing device. In, in fact, I'm just looking at our around our office here, and I can see a, a postcard that a patient has given me with her picture of her graduation that she was able to use, uh, that she was able to attend. I can see a, a picture of a hummingbird because it was the first time somebody was able to hear a hummingbird. It is truly an amazing device. Uh, when people come in or before they get it, they, you know, you're speaking loudly, you're speaking, speaking slowly, you have to look at them, and when they come back with the cochlear implant it's like you forget that they're deaf well this is a f bit of a funny example but it's like i'm, I'm asking uh, and and this and because i do know two people who have had this surgery an uncle of mine was born deaf uh in his 60s finally went and had a cochlear implant and i remember him saying he cried when he passed gas because he didn't know there was a sound associated with it like, of all the things, right? Anyhow, um, I also know that it's not a simple surgery that makes a correction, like fixing another organ. Like, if you had appendicitis, you go in, you cut out the bad part, and, you know, everybody moves on. There is a lot of post-operative uh, uh, after one of these cochlear implants, is there not? Um, there is a there is some work to it. Uh, I'm always saying, Dr. Lee and I have the easy job. Putting in the cochlear implant in the operating room takes an hour and a half or so to do. Um, it's one of the few times we get to operate on, by and large, a normal ear. The anatomy itself is normal. It's the, the intricate physiology in the inner ear, which is not normal. But, but uh, the surgery itself is the easy part. The patient comes back you know, a few weeks after surgery when it's all healed up. That's where the hard part begins. Uh, it's not simply flipping a switch and away you go. They really need to learn to hear again in many respects. The, uh, typically the high frequencies, which are really important for understanding speech, they haven't heard for, for many years. And when the implant is first turned on, they say it sounds like the chipmunks. It sounds like Donald Duck. Um, and they really need to get used to having that high frequency hearing and, and understanding what that means. So the hard part is on the side of the patient. And Dr. Lee, we know there's another option, uh, which we also know that you know something about. It's the implantable bone anchored hearing aid program. Uh, what can you tell us about that? A hearing aid is much different than a cochlear implant. A bone anchored hearing aid is only used when the inner ear or the cochlea is working well. So it's used when there's a problem in the outer or the middle ear. Um, some patients are born, you know, without an ear canal, and that device works really well. What it does is there's a little screw that goes in behind the ear into the skull. 
So it's a small procedure that you implant the screw into the skull and then you put a, essentially like a hearing aid on the outside. What that does is it vibrates the skull and bypasses uh, the outer and middle ear and goes right to the organ of hearing so patients can hear. So some patients won't be able to use hearing aids. Some patients, for unfortunately, they have chronic infections or their ears are always draining, um, which is sometimes made worse by wearing hearing aids. Um, and there's other problems that are quite difficult to fix with surgery. So those are good um, alternatives that are quite safe to do. I'm Joanne Sutton with Next Gen Audiologist and Teaching Professional, Dr. Ted Venema. Stay with us. We're going to be talking about sudden hearing loss. That's next with our experts, Dr. Brian Westerberg and Dr. Jane Lee, all on Boomer Life right here on CL650. Celebrating the baby boomer lifestyle. This is Boomer Life on CL650.